Well, I, uh, I, this is actually part two of the message from last week, and I titled, I titled the message, An Unbroken Promise. So this is an unbroken promise part two. Real quick, I'm just going to write a couple of things on the board. And so the, main, the emphasis of the message was about this guy right here. If you'll remember. Mephibosheth. But also the preliminary or the, the uh, context of the story also has to do with Jonathan and David. And so Mephibosheth is the main character that we're talking about, but his father was Jonathan. And so whenever you go back to the story, we had studied it a few weeks back. When you go back to the story, what you learn is that Jonathan and David were uh, close friends, right? One of the things that, uh, we, that, that whenever we teach the Old Testament... And many of you are already familiar with this, but just so that we're on the same page. There's a lot of times that there's things called types and shadows in the Old Testament. Where, at least this is the way that I've communicated it, that believing that God is a much greater author, if we could speak in human terms like Paul would say, than any human being that's ever lived. Human beings used con use concepts like analogies and typologies to describe things. In the Old Testament, it is my belief that the Old Testament Israel is a type of the believer for the New Testament. Why would you say that? Because even the Apostle Paul said they were examples unto us. When we watch Israel, we can consider them big brother as they travel the journey of life and they go through their failures and their faults. And yet at the same time, they realize where they failed God as a nation and then they would repent collectively and embrace God and embrace his ways. New Testament Christian, his life is similar. He's on a journey. The Bible says in the New Testament and in the Old Testament alike that we are pilgrims on a journey. That this place is not our home. Abraham was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. You and I should be looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. In other words, we can't allow the roots of this earth to cling to us too tightly that we don't want to leave and ultimately be with the Lord in the will that he has for us regarding eternity. In the midst of all of that, we see types and shadows. We see God writing with a pen, if you will, upon the scripture and preparing us, really writing the story at least two different times regarding the Old and the New Testament. And so in the, in the relationship that we saw between David and Jonathan as friends, we learned that as a type of that they are a type of the Lord and a type of the believer, the body of Christ. Why is that? Well, David, and I'm not going to go back into it completely because you should be okay with this. David is a type of Jesus Christ. In multiple ways, he's also a type of the believer at times. But in multiple ways and in certain circumstances, David as a type of, the, of Christ some of the examples we used last week was just the fact that the angel Gabriel, when he came to Mary, he said, you know, brought her comfort, brought her peace and said that your son will sit upon the throne of his father, David, Hallelujah. for an eternity. Amen. Just in that sense that David was a type of the king that would come. Amen. The fulfillment is in Jesus. That's He's right. the king of kings and the Lord of lords, but he descends from the house of David. Amen. Jonathan, the reason that we, we take the concept of Jonathan as a type of the believer making up the body of Christ is because of the relationship that they have. Would you put Romans chapter 6 verse 5 up there? The Bible says in the Old Testament that Jonathan and David's soul were united as one. The idea in the, in the language is that they were knitted together. And when we look at this scripture right here for the New Testament Christian, it says... For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. I got to tell you that that word planted right there, in many translations, the word instead of planted is united. And with the word in the Greek, and I kind of talked to you about this last week, has this prefix right here. I'm not trying to get all, you know, deep on you, but I, at the same time I am. <laughs> I am trying to get deep on you. So let me not say that. 
But at the same time, it's not that difficult to understand. This prefix, sin, is where we get the word synonym. As a matter of fact, I looked it up last week. I've been telling y'all that that's what it meant for a couple of years now. And finally looked it up and thank the Lord I was right in that. But this is the thing. Synonym, synonoma in the Greek means the same name. That's where we get the word synonym from. So words that are the same have the same meaning. It means the same. In the Greek language, that word planted is has that prefix in it. And so it's describing the fact that we became one with Jesus. Amen. It is death, his burial and his resurrection. Just as the old man born of Adam died with Jesus at Calvary. I know that Jesus died 2,000 years ago, but when you heard the gospel message, the good news about Jesus Christ and Him crucified, then you put faith in that. If you, When you believe from the heart, then the Word of God teaches that the old man that was born of Adam, that was ravaged by sin in this fallen world, was united with Jesus at Calvary, in God's mind anyway. Whether or not you knew this is a whole other story. But what I will say is this, is that if your initial salvation was anything like mine, and maybe we're all a little bit different, then you felt a burden lifted off your back when you right. truly got saved. Amen? You know what I'm talking about. So, in, and, and you might not have known all this theology that I'm talking about. <laughs> But what you experienced was the power of Calvary when you got saved. Yeah. Whether you, didn't, you don't need to know, you don't have to know it all to get saved. Amen. But you do need to know some things in order to continue to walk with the Lord. Right. You got to understand the word of God. But on that day when you heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, the fact that you were born a sinner, the fact that Jesus died for your sin and you believed it from the heart in God's mind, you rushed back to Calvary. You were united with him at Calvary. You died with him at Calvary. You were buried with him in the tomb and a new man was resurrected to newness of life. That's what you felt. You felt the bondage of the old man leaving and you felt the liberation of the new man in Christ being filled with the life of God. Hallelujah. You had received according to Ezekiel 36, a new heart, a new spirit, and God's spirit was placed on the inside of you, man. That's a good, that's a good plan. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. And, and when we go back to, to the concept of Mephibosheth, the story that we learned about Mephibosheth, yes, he was Jonathan's son, but whenever the news reached the nanny, if you'll remember the story, I talked about it last week, his milkmaid, okay, once again, his nanny, we'll just leave it at that. His nanny heard the story that Jonathan and Saul died on the battlefield. Saul was the grandpa, he was the king, Jonathan was the next in line, Mephibosheth was Jonathan's son, theoretically he would have been in line to be on the throne. But the truth is, is that Jonathan, as a type of the believer, knew that David had been anointed king. And they, this is another part about their friendship. I was transitioning to Mephibosheth, but let me back up a second. That, that was another reason why their relationship is a type of the believer with Jesus, because they had made a covenant together. David and Jonathan had made a covenant together. Jonathan was the rightful heir to the throne, <coughs> according to the physical realm, the way it looked, because he was Saul's son. But Jonathan knew that God had rejected Saul. Rejected Saul because of sin. And Jonathan knew that God had anointed David. And what Jonathan said was, I'm not going to sit here. I love you. My heart is one with you. And he says, and what I'm asking you to do is to make a covenant with me. That when the Lord dispels, disperses all of your enemies and you sit upon the throne, that you forget me not, that you forget my family not. So they made a covenant with one another. And God made a covenant with you and I when he sent his son Jesus, amen, excuse me, to die on the cross for our sin. Praise God. So we see this picture of the type of Christ and the type of the believer and the interconnectedness that we have through salvation. Now going back to Mephibosheth. The news reaches the name that Jonathan and Saul die on the battlefield. She, in fear, attempts to save the offspring, the heir of Saul. And she takes off running. We're not told exactly what happened, but in some way she stumbled and fell. I just want to kind of like pause for a moment and just let us ponder about the concept of a stumble and a fall. Because Adam in the garden fell. That's good. And the result of the fall was great for young Mephibosheth. 
How old he was, we don't really know, but he was small enough for her to carry in her arms. And somehow when she fell, something obviously was broken in the legs. The boy became crippled. The Bible says he was lame from that day forward. He could not walk right. Last week I quoted a scripture out of Hebrews chapter 11. It talked about making the lame foot straight so that you would not walk out of the way. And I kind of did some silly thing where I acted like I had a little bit of a lame foot. And what it did was it made me veer off to the right instead of allowing me to walk a straight and a narrow path. That's the problem with humanity. Like Mephibosheth, a type of the fall, we found ourselves born of Adam lame and incapable in our own strength to walk the straight path and instead veering off. And so we have in this story Mephibosheth, the type of the fall of man, a type of the sinful nature affecting mankind. And we also have in this story a type of Christ and the union between the believer and Jesus. Amen. The first point that I preached on last week, real quick, was the name Mephibosheth itself. If you'll remember, does anybody remember what Mephibosheth means? Okay, okay look at your old notes. <laughs> Mephibosheth, what does Mephibosheth mean? It means exterminating the idols. That's a cool name. Mephibosheth, the exterminating the idols. And whenever we looked at that particular word there, that was point number one, getting rid of the idols. And I, made, I made the point that, you know, sometimes or it, you, there may be the danger that someone sitting in here at first gl glance or first sound would have said, oh, well, I ain't Catholic. I never was Catholic or I'm not Catholic anymore. He's talking about statues. He's talking about saints. I'm, I don't follow that. I, I'm going to take a nap till he, till he gets to point number two. But that's not what we're talking about. It's true. Those are idols. The saints that the Catholic people pray to are idols. The statues that they have in their yard are idols. Even Jesus hanging on a cross that they look to is an idol. You know why? Because it defers them or it distracts them. They look at this. They look at that. They look at the saints. It distracts them from finding the real Jesus. Amen. It stands between them and the truth of the gospel that would actually liberate their heart and their soul. And instead, they're caught up in religion. So in a sense, it is true. But what I wanted to speak to you about last week, or what I did speak to you about last week, was the fact that an idol is anything that stands between Amen. you and God. Anything in your life that gets between you and the Lord. And each and every one of us every day deal with those situations and circumstances, right? I mean, sometimes they're big things. The bigger an idol is in your life, the more havoc it will wreak in your life and possibly even in other people's lives around you, right? I mean, there's some idols that people can't get free from and we could call them addictions, whatever we want to. But the reality of it is, is that they're idols that stand in the way. Some of them are so bad. They mess people's life up so bad that it affects everybody around them. We get that. And sometimes the idol may be relatively small. It's not small in God's eyes. But what I'm trying to say is, is that it's really only affecting us and our ability to walk properly with the Lord. It stands between us and God. Now, point number two actually had to do with the place that Mephibosheth was from. He was from a place called Lodabar. Does anybody remember what Lodabar means? Lodabar means not a pasture. Another way to say it would be a barren place. Not a pasture, a barren place. It's not a place of green grass where the sheep can feed and pasture, but instead it's barren. It's dark, it's brown, it's dried up. See, the thing of it is, is this, is that oftentimes idols in our life, things that we're looking for to seek pleasure from, or things that are just in our life that prevent us from getting to the presence of God, lead us to a barren place. Yes, amen. They lead us, leave us empty. Yes. You know, one of the things that I spoke of last week also was I kind of gave you this concept of this big old... Word. I don't know why, but I think it was because God wanted me to preach on it. It was a word called, and I added spiritual in front of it, anhedonia. Y'all remember that? 
this word anhedonia, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, that word entered into my head as I was driving back from work. And I remembered it. That's a psychology word that I learned back in nursing school. And, um, I, you know, and I remembered immediately, even though I don't really like psychology and I didn't pay too much attention whenever I learned it, what it meant was a lack of pleasure. You, you can't even experience pleasure anymore. And from there, I went down this pathway of talking about dopamine receptors in the brain and how things that we seek after the idols in our life cause an increase in dopamine in the, in the brain and cause us to feel good for a moment in time. And essentially, that's what sin will do to us. Various types of sin will cause a bump in dopamine, right? And the next thing you know, I mean, I'm just saying like, they say, I've never, I've never done it before, but they say that like certain drugs, well, we won't even have, we don't have to name them all, but certain drugs, like the first time you, you take a hit of it, it's like whew, you get this huge rush of causing all these chemicals in your brain that make you feel so good and that people for the rest of their life seek after that feeling again and never find it. And then when you stimulate that dopamine enough times over and over and over again, yet your brain almost becomes desensitized to it. And the next thing you know, you end up in this place of anhedonia. You see, what I would say that the psychologist doesn't know because he refuses to believe that God is real, this whole thing is spiritual to begin with. Because it's all played out and sin will only leave you empty and it'll never bring you to a place where you find fulfillment right. and joy. Right. And you keep on seeking it. You keep on searching for it. And the only thing that can really bring fulfillment to the heart is Jesus. Amen. And the reality of it is, is this, is that many times even us in this room will still mm. look for and seek for something Amen. to, to, to yeah. fill the void rather than looking to Jesus yeah. as the answer that we're really looking for. And we fall through into this trap time and again. So that was the first point. First point was getting rid of the idols, exterminating the idols, because they leave us, point number two, in barren places that are not a pasture that, and, and leave us with this feeling of spiritual anhedonia. But the third thing, let's go ahead and just go back and read the passage of Scripture again real quick. We're going to go to, uh, let's see, I believe it was 2 Samuel chapter 9. Verses 1 through 7. And let's just go ahead and read the story again. That way we're all on the same page. It's only a few verses. And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Remember, they had that covenant that they made together. And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said unto him, he said, thy servant is he. And the king said, is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, behold, he is in the house of Maker, the son of Amiel and Lodabar. And that reminds me whenever I was first kind of like studying this in the morning last week. I looked up that name Maker because I didn't put it in my uh, in my notes, and the name means to sold. So it's kind of this, this. So this just gets really too good to pass up because now you have Mephibosheth lame, crippled from a fall, living in the house of a man named Sold, sold into slavery in his first birth, lame from the womb, if you will, like our first birth in Adam, sold into slavery. This is good news. It's not in my notes, but you need to hear this. That's why Jesus paid a ransom price, a redemption. That's what the word redemption means. A, pro, a, a release through a price that has been paid. Sold into slavery, but freed through a price that has been paid. Verse 5. Then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Maker, the son of Amiel from Lodabar, now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was coming to David, he fell on his face. I want you to see that part because that's point number three. We're about to get to it. He fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold thy servant. Notice that too. Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee 
all the land, restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. Father, we just thank you for your beautiful word. We pray, Lord God, that you would speak to us and that you'd give us revelation of reverence, revelation of humility, and revelation of restoration. In Jesus' name, we pray. So that was what he did. That's point number three, reverence and act of humility. And I know we kind of got into it a little bit, but then I stopped. He fell on his face. Amen. Second Samuel chapter nine, verse six, Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, when he saw David, he fell on his face and he responded to David and he said, thy, behold thy servant. Now, one of the things that I talked about last week was I mentioned to you and reminded you, and you don't really have to go there, even though Manuel is going to do it anyway. He's going to try to go there, and I'm going to see y'all trying to read while I'm not even really reading the passage, but it's okay. You can do that, brother. Deuteronomy chapter 15, it says in verses 12 through 17, it talks about the bond slave. I'm not going to read the text, but I want to remind you of it. That in the year of Jubilee, you remember what the story was? That a, a Hebrew man who didn't have the money to take care of himself, God had made a provision in the law that he could sell himself to his Hebrew brother and that the law stated that he would be his servant, his slave, for six years, six the number of man, the day that God created man on the sixth day, but on the seventh year you were to release him and set him free. Because the seventh year was a type of a jubilee, and seven sevens was literally a jubilee, and that is the representative of a Sabbath, a time frame of rest, a time frame of freedom, a time frame of liberty, because it's a reminder, or it was a type of, the fact that Jesus would be our Sabbath. Listen, I didn't plan to say this, but I'm going to say it. If you run into a Seventh-day Adventist out on the street and they want to argue with you that you're not saved and you're not going to heaven because of the fact that you don't go to church on a Saturday and instead you go to church on a Sunday, you need to understand something. That's a bunch of hogwash. Right. That is a lie from the pit of hell. It's an idol that has gotten in between them and the truth of the gospel. It's a false doctrine from a demon spirit that's trying to convince them of some concept that doesn't even matter what what does it matter what day of the reason that the church goes to church on Sunday is because that's the day that the Lord resurrected from the dead is there anything wrong with going to church on a Saturday absolutely not but whenever you start telling people that you're not going to heaven because you don't go to church on a Saturday you're completely missing the point of what the revelation of Sabbath is Jesus is Sabbath Jesus is rest he says come unto me you who are weary and heavy laden I will give you rest Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light, and you will find rest for your weary soul. Yes. Amen. It doesn't matter what day of, uh, you go to church. Amen. It matters that you yoke yourself to Jesus. And so on that seventh year, the bond slave was set free. Amen. That's why the reason I brought that up was because Mephibosheth called himself servant. He humbled himself, he fell on his face, he called King David, Behold thy servant. It requires a level of humility to indenture yourself as a slave. The Apostle Paul said in the book of Romans, Paul, an apostle, of, uh, an apostle, a bond slave of Jesus Christ. One of the concepts, and I know that I've said this many times and I kind of made a big deal about it whenever I went, I, I think I walked out of the view of the camera, but one of the things about the bond slave was, was that in the seventh year you were able to go free, amen, and you were able to take everything back with you that you came with, but if you didn't want to leave because your master was too good to leave, it said you would go to the doorpost, right, I'm not going to go walk over there and do all that. But you go to the doorpost and you stick your earlobe up against the doorpost and you take an awl, which is kind of like a pointy type, look like an ice pick, I think. And you would shove it through your ear and then you'd wear an earring. And basically that was a sign that you were a willing slave of your master because you didn't want to go because he was too good to That's leave. Right. Like Peter said, Jesus said, will you leave me too? Whenever Jesus says, basically, this is what's on the menu. My body is real meat. My blood is real drink. He wasn't talking about transubstantiation. You'll catch that when you study transubstantiation. But in other words, he wasn't talking about the Catholic doctrine that it turns into literal flesh and literal blood. Later on, he even says it in John chapter 6. 
He says that, that, my, that the flesh profits nothing. My words are spirit and they are life. He's talking about the fact that his body, the flesh, that was the, was the, the sinless one that was given as a gift from the Father to die on the cross, his blood, the sacrifice, and that if you would feed on that, you would be nourished spiritually, just like physical food nourishes Amen. the physical body. It requires a level of humility. Amen. Paul says, I'm a bond slave of Jesus Christ. A willingness to humble self to the king. This act of reverence, this act of humility begins a process in Mephibosheth's life, which we'll get to in point four. It begins a process of restoration. And he falls upon his face and he says, thy servant you know, I was thinking about this. I was thinking, man, how easy. The enemy is so good at causing us to become bitter in situations and circumstances. Amen. I mean, come on, somebody. Yeah. Help me out here. I ain't the only one. I'm not the only one that gets frustrated with other people. I'm not the only one that gets frustrated with other circumstances. And that's why it's called a fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians chapter 5, it says that patience is a fruit of the Spirit, which means Patience in circumstances, but long suffering is a fruit of the spirit, which means patience in relationships. Jesus was long suffering with you. Jesus was long suffering with me. Why can't I be long suffering with others? Because it's not a fruit of Matt. It's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has to produce it in Matt, but Matt has to be willing to humble himself to allow the Holy Spirit to do his work. And if Matt refuses to humble himself, it'll never happen. Instead, he's just going to become bitter. And I was thinking about Mephibosheth, and I was thinking about the fact that according to the world standards, his likelihood is that he is going to be bitter. I mean, think about it. What a, what a, a, a hand of cards to be dealt. I mean, I would have probably sat on the throne of Israel. I would have probably succeeded my father, Jonathan, but because of somebody else's sin, not even my sin, not even my daddy's sin, but my grandpa's sin, all that was destroyed. Then not only that, when he died, this nanny takes me and she runs with me trying to fix the situation and she falls and now I'm crippled. And now it's like I'm like a dog. What I, I don't really like my life. I'll put in my notes, ugh, I hate my life. <laughs> I mean, think about that. What a, what a twist of events. How easy to become bitter by life. Not happy with the, the, the hand that I've been dealt. But the reality is this, is that he saw the goodness of the king. He saw the king extending a hand of hope, a hand of love. And his response was, he fell on his face. He humbled himself. Let's look at uh, Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 through 28. Cause, and we're just, this is just a scripture to talk a little bit about humility. A little bit about the difference between elevating self versus humbling self. A couple scriptures on this. Look at this. But Jesus called them unto him and said, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them. And they that are great exercise authority upon them. Now, you know what this is, the context is? When the sons of thunder, we preached about them a while back, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus and said, Hey, which one of us are you going to let us sit on your right hand? Jesus is like, you got the whole picture wrong. And this kingdom that I've brought from my Father in heaven onto this earth, the meek shall inherit the earth. The king rides into town on a donkey, not a stallion. The babe is born in a manger, not a palace. And if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for his people. Right. And he says, you're thinking like the Gentiles. You're thinking like the world thinks. You're thinking that because you got some elevated position and you've been walking around with the king, that now you deserve some kind of special treatment. But your mindset is all wrong. He says, but it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. Let him be your servant. Let him humble himself 
And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. I can remember, and I've said this before, but when I used to preach at the old church where I was, when I'd get my opportunity on Wednesday night sometimes, I was, I was, boy, look, I was knee deep in this concept back then. Man, it was a revelation to me. I've been over here trying to live my life for myself, and Jesus is trying to say, no, boy, you need to die. You need to die in me so that true life can be given to you. And so when I'd preach over there, I'd be like, you thought that this life was about you? No, this isn't about you. This is about Jesus. And I can remember somebody coming to me later and saying, Preacher, or they didn't call me that. They're like, Brother Matt, Matt, you keep saying that it's not about me because I probably repeated myself 10, you know, because I only knew the old, the old pastor made fun of me one time. And he was probably right, but it was the Lord leading. He said, Man, all you ever preach on is Romans chapter 6. Well, later on, I said, you know what? Until you get Romans 6 right, you ain't going to get nothing else right. So the Lord kept me right there for quite some time. Because it talks about dying in union with Jesus. But I, but I, said, I said, no, you're right. It is about you, brother. He, God the Father bankrupted heaven just for you. If you were the only person to ever walk the face of the earth, Jesus came to the earth to die just for you. God, Jesus died so that you could be restored. Jesus died so that whatever it is that you need, you could access his grace and it would be given unto you. But at some point in time, he wants you to grow up. Amen. He wants you and me to grow up and to pull our... Well, I don't know that he wants us to ever do that, but that's what daddy used to say. Pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Don't do that. You can't do it. Trust in the Lord. He wants you to trust in him. And for your old man born of Adam to die, and for the new man resurrected to newness of life, to take upon the spirit of the Holy Spirit, and to see others, amen, and to live a life of selflessness instead amen. of selfishness. Amen. We can live through his whole life serving self and end up in the end in a spiritual anhedonia, a load of bar, a barren place, and not really ever amen. accomplishing what the Lord had called us to do. And if you keep on seeking for that to happen, I mean, listen, and you got a preacher. If you flip through the channels, you're going to find a preacher to speak to you yeah. in those situations and circumstances. And you're and you're going to, and, and to some extent, it's going to make your flesh feel good, because like Mephibosheth, you're going to feel like you have a right to something. That's right. You see what no. I'm saying? Right. Mephibosheth, but it, it, you could have felt that way. But no. <sighs> He had the right idea. He fell on his face and he reverenced the king. And he says, here is your servant. Here's another text on humility. John chapter 13. We take this from Jesus. We're just going to read verses 4 and 5. John 13, 4 and 5. I love this passage of scripture because this is a New Testament type of some, some major theology right here. John 13. We're getting deep. 4 through 5. It says, he rises from supper. Talking about Jesus at the last supper. And laid aside his garments. He took off his outer garments. And then it says, and he girded himself with a towel. Just as Jesus, who in the beginning was deity. He was God, the word who spoke the world into existence. The Bible says in Philippians 2, 6, though he was in the form of God, he considered it not something to be grasped to, but instead he humbled himself. He lowered himself. He became a man. He became a servant so that he could die a servant's death. He unrobes himself of his outer garment. He unrobes himself of his deity. He lowers himself and he girds himself with a towel, which is a type of work that he's about to perform. And then he reaches down and he says, he pours water into a basin and he begins to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. A picture of Jesus unclothing himself of deity, humbling and clothing himself with humanity so he could serve us through death. In order for God's will to take place in our lives, there will have to be true repentance and true repentance is connected to a humble, not a prideful hardened heart the work that Jesus is doing right here we're going to get into it a little bit more in my last point but the work that Jesus is doing right here has to do with washing has to do with cleansing amen. it's a type of what he would do for us when he died on the cross amen but let's take a look at 1 Peter 5 verses 5 through 10 we I, I actually 
preached on this passage of scripture a few weeks back on a Wednesday night, but some of y'all weren't here. So we get to revisit it again. Amen. It has to do with humility. It has to. I'm, I'm just trying to drive this point home. He fell on his face and he reverenced himself. And this was a catalyst that drove him towards restoration. Amen. It says in 1 Peter 5 verses 5 through 10. Which is going to go ahead and read the whole passage. It says, likewise, you younger submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you subject one to another. And be clothed with humility. I, I like, I mean, I didn't plan this. I'm telling you, I didn't think about this, but I just put that scripture this morning about Jesus girding himself with the towel. He clothed himself with humility. All right. That, this is, we're going to clothe ourselves with what Jesus looks like. He says, For God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, into the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So I want to kind of talk to you a little bit about some, a lot of these concepts that are in this particular passage of Scripture. There, there, there's a lot of things to talk about in this particular passage of Scripture. All right. So the first part was, he says, likewise, you younger submit yourselves to the elder. We're talking about pride versus humility. You know, to submit to the elder. Have you ever just seen now what it's talking about here? He's really talking about younger pastors submitting yourself to a. a to a, a person that's in authority over you in ministry, right? But then there's other scriptures that talk about, and so we don't, but we don't blindly submit ourselves just because somebody's been in ministry longer than us. No, but the Bible also talks about the fact that we are to submit ourselves one to another. It says right here. It goes on to say, subject yourself to each other. Have you ever noticed, let, let's just back up a little bit and talk about the parent and the child relationship. Because every one of us have been a child in this room and every one of us, not maybe not every one of us have been a parent, but every one of us has been, at least been a child in this room. And at some point in time in that relationship, what we felt was a resistance towards humbling self towards the parent. Can I get an amen? amen. Lord knows I caused a lot of problems for my mom, my poor mama. Lord knows. I, and, and, and I'll be honest with you. A lot of the rebellion that my mom experienced by me was really poor daddy was really me rebelling against him. It's just that he was in Houston and he didn't bear, I mean, he bore a little bit of it, but you know what? I just think about all, oh Lord, this is a whole nother thing. I don't need to bore y'all with all this, but how much misery they must have had. Yeah. Like, dude, I was a mess. How concerned they must have been. Thank God. That his hand of protection was on me. Yes. <laughs> I've just got this flood of thoughts running through my mind of all of the different precarious situations. Like I just got, I, I'm just telling you, like I can't even get into all the memories. I'm going to tell you one. I might have said it before. I was in a car with my ex-girlfriend driving down the road. She had this cool little Z, blue Z28. Her and I were, had a very toxic relationship. And she did something that got me mad. And I had been drinking and I told her to stop the car because I was going to get out and walk. She said, I ain't stopping nothing. And she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, driving down Johnson Street, I opened the door and bailed out. About 30 miles an hour. <sighs> Rolled down the road into the ditch, popped up, walked down the road. And I knew that there was another party going on over there. And I was like, hey, what's up? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, for your hand of protection. Because yes. yes. I ain't that cool to pull that off. <laughs> Trust me. And that's just one little stupid episode. Please don't try to bail out of the car unless you're being abducted, then it's worth it, right? Because you never know what's going to happen if somebody abducts you. I'm just saying, like, you know, if the, the door ain't locked, dude, bail out. But that's another story for another time. All right. 
Subject yourself to the elder. Right? And that's where I was really kind of coming from is like this refusal to humble self, this refusal to submit because like Satan, there's a pride that rises up on the inside of her life and says, they don't know what's best for me. Right. It, whenever people try to bring correction in our life, it's like there's I don't know about you, but I'm having a problem with correction. I've had a problem with authority. I want to rise up against it. OK, but he says to subject yourself to one uh, to to the eldership. Not only that, to subject yourself also to one another. You know, the reality of it is, is that just because somebody's the preacher doesn't mean that they're always right. I'm just going to be honest with you. I hope that you can see at least I mean well whenever I say something like that. Listen, we submit to one another as we submit to Christ. Amen. Everybody's level at the foot of the cross. That's one of the things that I've heard some of the Bible students talk about. They understand that their professors over there at Brother Swagger's Bible College aren't perfect because they're men. But one of the things I'll say is, is that, dude, we are, it's like you, you don't feel this air of superiority yeah. looking down on you. Like we're, we're one in Christ. Amen. We're all yeah. level at the cross. Amen. Now, one of the things is that he fell on his face. He reverenced before the king and the Bible says that God resists the proud but he gives grace to the humble if we're unwilling to humble ourselves and to submit ourselves to the Lord and when we submit ourselves to the Lord then guess what it does it causes a humility in our horizontal relationships when we when we humble self vertically to the Lord we hum we are able to walk with humility in our relationships amen, amen on earth one of the things I put a bunch of different, I really broke this down on the Wednesday night. And we'll just real quick, we'll go through a couple of them because I don't want to spend over the amount of time. But the concept of resisting the proud, when you look that up in the Greek, I thought this was interesting. It says to set an army against. And I can't help but think, like I know that God's not scared of anything. But you know, Paul, and I'm about to use a big fancy word, but just bear with me because I'm going to tell you the definition. Anthropomorphic. <laughs> What it means is like we get, the, get that from the word anthropology, humanity, morphic, morphology, the form of man. Paul uses and the Bible uses anthropomorphic qualities to describe God. Human-like qualities to describe God. Why? Because we're human beings and it's difficult for us to understand God in all of his revelation and glory. That's why he sent Jesus, the perfect representation of the invisible God, so that we could see something in human form to understand and to get a revelation of what God really is. So I'm using this as an anthropomorphic term, an idea but I understand that God's not really scared or intimidated by anything. You get, you get what I'm trying to say? Probably the word wouldn't be fear, but intimidation. Or maybe not even intimidation, but an arousal to, to defend self. Maybe that's what I'm thinking about. Because that's what the word resisted means, to set an army against. And I can't help myself but to think in human terms of the fact that Satan, full of pride, tried to elevate himself above God. And now as he's injected mankind with his poison, mankind tries to also elevate himself above God. That's a whole other story. But each in our individual lives, when we become prideful, refusal to submit to God's ways, refusal to submit to his word, God sees that symptom of Satan and he sets himself like an army against it. See, you understand what I'm trying to say? And, and, and he resists the proud. It's kind of like two opposite sides of a magnet when you try to make them come together and they repel one another. God's repelled against pride. But he gives grace to the humble. Amen. He reverenced himself. He fell on his face. He called himself servant. This word here to cast all your cares on him. It means to throw your cares on the Lord. Lord, I can't, I can't handle it. You got to take it. And then, then the next question is, well, I've tried to do that, but it's not working. Well, the next question we have to ask ourselves, have we humbled ourselves? Humbled ourselves to God in his ways. At the same time, let me just say this. What does it even mean to throw, to throw your cares? The only way I know how to describe it is, is that in the moment of your worst turmoil, because unfortunately, sometimes we have to end up like Mephibosheth, in order to be willing to fall on our face. God doesn't always want it to be that way. 
As a matter of fact, he'd much prefer, I speak, you listen, and bow. Mm -hmm. He would rather it be that way, right? Wouldn't you rather your children be that way? <laughs> I speak, you listen, and bow, child. But unfortunately, it doesn't really happen, right? And so what ends up happening is, is that we have to come many times to a place of pain. And in that pain, the only way I know how to describe it is that morning that it happened for me regarding what went down with my sister. I felt so much pain, so much brokenness, and I didn't really know where else to turn. Nothing else was working. I'd already been a Christian, but for the first time in my life, I cried out to God. And I just said whatever was on my heart, but it was in the middle of, dude, I'm telling you, like, I know what daddy said. He said, men don't cry. Dad didn't know, like. Anyway, whatever. He didn't know about God. He didn't know about spiritual things. I had been suppressing all kind of pain, all kind of stuff for so long. And in the, I, was, I was an emotional mess that morning in my living room at about 4.30 in the morning. And in the midst of that emotional mess, I cried out to God. And it was the most liberating thing that I've ever experienced in my life. So all I know to say is, is that whenever you're, you're the most emotional and you're in your most pain, that's what I'm saying. Throw your cares on the Lord. Why? Because he cares for you and he wants you to do that. But many times it's pride and a refusal to fall on the face and to reverence self before the king that prevents us from getting to that place. One last thing I wanted to say was, is that he talked about the fact that afflictions are accomplished in this world. Why you're going, the enemy is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He wants to swallow you whole. That's what that word means. He wants to swallow you whole. And many are the afflictions of the people on this earth. I just wanted to mention this last little concept that we're moving on to point number four. And we're going to close this message. But one of the things that I wanted to, wanted to say was this, is that Afflictions are being accomplished in people's lives on this earth. Can I, can I, can I give you a, a revelation? Newsflash, you ain't the only one going through stuff. Now, that's a good word. As a matter of fact, a good word for every last one of us in this place, including the preacher. You ain't the only one going through this stuff. You listening on the camera. You ain't the only one feeling the afflictions of this earth. This earth has fallen. We've all been born like Mephibosheth. There's a whole bunch of pain involved in sin. And guess what? People experience him up. But you know what? You Sometimes you swear you talk to people and they just got it way worse than everybody else. Yeah. And sometimes some people's situations are worse than what your situation is. But nevertheless, people's pain is real, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And to hold on to the Lord, each of us as individuals learning how to humble self, realizing that the enemy is our adversary, realizing that he desires to devour us and casting our cares upon the Lord. And trusting in God is the only way for health and healing and peace to take place. Amen. We, we need God to heal us. Because if not, the alternative is bitterness. Point number four, restoration. David said unto him, fear not, in verse 7, for I will restore you. I'm going to restore the land of your father Saul unto you. I'm going to restore you. That word means to return to the starting point. Restoration, to return to the starting point. And I just thought, what a beautiful thought that is. Now, some people may say, hold on a second, preacher. I want to go back to the starting point of my life. Hey, my starting point of my life is a mess, right? Everybody's got a story. Everybody's been through things when they were young. That's not what he's talking about. Whenever God talks about returning to the starting point, he's, the idea is talking about before the fall. And I'm not trying to say that when you get saved and you truly learn to throw everything on the Lord, that we go back immediately to this place before the fall, because that's not really going to happen on this side of the fall. Amen? But really, when you look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, you can go to that passage of Scripture. It's talking about God's presence. It says, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. We, we've studied this passage of scripture multiple times. But what we know from this passage of scripture is that now they're hiding themselves in the midst of the trees. But this seems like a common occurrence where God would show up and walk with them and talk with them. 
God's presence was with them. Sin drove a wedge between God's presence and his creation. Restoration of the presence of God with man. Once again, it doesn't go all the way back to the way it was prior to the fall. But when we humble self, reverence the king, repent of where we've been, it begins a process of restoration in our life. Bringing us back to a place where his presence would be with us. Real quick, Titus chapter 3 verses 5 through 7. It says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. These two words in here, regeneration and renew, both of them have the word renovation in them, the idea of restoration. But, you know, the word regeneration is talking about the washing that takes place initially. It's kind of like Jesus unclothing himself in that story so that he could come to the earth to die on the cross. When you first put your faith in Christ, regeneration takes place. A renovation happens to the internal aspect of man. You receive a new heart from God. But then the renewal begins. That's an ongoing daily process where the Holy Spirit working through the word and the work of what Jesus has already accomplished changes you. That's why whenever in that scripture, Peter's response was, you won't wash me. And Jesus's response to him was, well, then you won't have nothing to do with me. How sad it is, countless millions even, refuse to be washed by the regeneration of Jesus' sacrifice. They reject the gospel. You won't accept the gospel that Jesus died for your sin and submit and become a sinner turned to saint, then you won't have anything to do with him. It's not like he doesn't love them. It's He proved his love. I, I probably would do a horrible job with this illustration because I don't remember exactly how it went. But I can't, I think it was the situation. Oh, this guy was trying to make an analogy and he was a teacher of a class and he brought a box of donuts. He wanted everybody to have donuts. And he said, y'all go ahead and enjoy these donuts and while y'all are eating them, I'm going to do push-ups because I'm going to pay exercise wise for you to be able to eat these donuts. He was trying to make an illustration. So he's over there pumping out push-ups. And all these people are like, oh man, this is cool. Yeah, I'll eat some donuts. So they're all eating donuts and then he looked at this one guy who would refuse to eat any donuts. He said, well, I don't want them donuts. And he said, well, you don't have to eat the donut. But I have paid the price for you to be able to eat the donut. And the idea behind it is, is that there's a lot of people that are going to reject the gospel. And they're going to say, I don't want Jesus to sacrifice for my sin. But the reality of it is, is that whether you want it or not, Jesus already did it. Whether you may leave it there, you know, the, the money's waiting for you in the bank and you may never go access it and deposit it. But the reality is, is that it's there. And it's not God's fault. People can be mad all they want to at God, but the reality is, is that God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross. And if you choose not to accept it, then how can you blame God? Yeah, I, I remember I used to tell people all the time, how can you serve a God? I know I've shared this with y'all. That sends people to hell. No, time out. I think I remember doing that before. Time out. God ain't sending nobody to hell. God the Father sent a lamb. He sent his only son to die on the cross for you. So anybody that goes to hell, God didn't send them there. Amen. They sent themselves there. They refused the regeneration, the washing that Jesus provided when he died at the cross. Amen. Peter said, you ain't going to wash me. Jesus said, well, then you won't have none of them. And then Peter's like, okay, well, then wash my whole body. Jesus like, no. You already, once you've been washed by the word, then your the whole body don't need to be washed. Now just your feet need to be washed. Regeneration, your initial Faith in Christ that saved you. And then sanctification. 
as you walk this journey called life, you're in a constant state of renewal. The Holy Spirit is dealing with you. The Holy Spirit is ministering on the inside of you. And Lord knows, I know Robert said it before, this old, this old world is so filthy that our feet are constantly getting dirty as we're walking through. We need the Lord to continue Amen. to renew us. Amen. Amen. On the Amen. inside. Jesus only had to die once, but sanctification is an ongoing change in us that will take place until we see the Lord. The idols in our lives only separate us from God's presence. It result in putting us in a barren land. Humility towards the gospel starts the process of restoration. There's no idol. There's no dopamine bump. There's no substitution that can ever take the place of walking with God. Like in the garden, a place of peace and we need to be reminded of 